Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast, a talk show that is called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do about the Beatles, the past, the present, their years together, their solo years, the music, the history, you name it, we cover it all here in this show. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'm one of the three regular co-hosts. You might know me for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, currently on 40 radio stations. And I'm also part of another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, which is all on the solo Beatles. And that's another bi-weekly show. It's a video podcast. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts, first of all, a man who's been a fixture on New York radio since 1983. He is a fixture, like a fixture on the wall (laughs) that you never, you never want to take down ever. (laughs) And uh, for so many years, he's delivered so many great programs. He is their Beatle expert there at the station. Done a lot of great interviews at the station as well. Even a few Beatle specials, like a Christmas Beatle special too. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. And like an old fixture, I've got dust hanging off me and cobwebs and everything. Great to be on board. Uh, another virus-free show here <laughs> with my friends Ken and... And Alan, who I'm about to uh, right. introduce. So you got dust and cobwebs. It's a shame this yeah, is not a video. Cob- this is not a video <laughs> podcast. That would have worked well. No, you, you, you do not want to see what I look like these days since I have not been out of the house, but four or five times in the past two months wow okay and our other co-host is uh the writer of a few beetle books you might be familiar with an ebook called got that something how the beetles i want to hold your hand changed everything and also he wrote a book called the beetles from the cavern to the rooftop for many many years writing in the classical department at the new york times also still a writer for Beatle Fan Magazine and lots of other publications. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. How's it going? And hello, everyone. Good, good. We have a special guest with us on the show this time out. He's Steve Matteo. And back in the year 2004, he released a book he, uh, he authored himself called Let It Be, all on the album and the film. And Steve, welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you, Ken. Great to be here. So we're going to be talking with Steve about his book and all the information and research and all the work he put into it and just his thoughts about Let It Be in general in just a moment. But first, as we normally do, we have the latest in Beatle news. And of course, the number one major news item, unfortunately, concerns the passing of Little Richard, one of the true pioneers and architects at the forefront of rock and roll and he was one of the big influences on the beatles of uh of those many 50s rockers the beatles performed twice with him in england in october of 1962 at the tower ballroom in brighton and also at the empire theater in liverpool and the beatles became friends with him in hamburg germany Uh, during a two-week stint there at the Star Club. And that was in November of 62. And uh, all you got to do is look up the history of the Beatles and all the songs that they covered that were Little Richard songs, or even songs that Little Richard covered that the Beatles still covered anyway. You've got songs like Long Tall Sally, The Medley of Kansas City, Hey, 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 Hey. First, by the way, uh, Little Richard recorded each of those songs separately. And then he uh, recorded as a medley. And that was the B-side of his single, Good Golly, Miss Molly, in 1958. He covered Kansas City, and it was a single for him in April of 59. The Beatles saw him perform the two songs as a medley, and uh, it led to it becoming part of their live set. They also uh, used to perform Ooh My Soul and Lucille. They did those songs on BBC Radio as well. They did the song Miss Anne during the Get Back, Let It Be sessions. John covered Slippin' and Slidin', the medley of Rip It Up and Ready Teddy, both uh, Little Richard songs. Although Elvis Presley also recorded both those songs. Um, Send Me Some Lovin' was a Little Richard song. Paul, in his solo career, recorded Kansas City and Lucille. 
And um, Long Tall Sally used to perform that during the first Wings tour. Uh, that was in the UK. Then the first European tour of Wings. He did it at the Princess Trust show. Um, he also performed Lucille during the first Wings tour in the UK. And at the concert for the people of Capuchia. One of my favorite live performances of all time from Paul was him doing live at the Capuchia concert. The song Shake a Hand from the Run Del Run album was first done by Faye Adams in 1953, covered by Little Richard, and that was a single for him in 1958. Also, a film that had Little Richard in it called The Girl Can't Help It uh, premiered on BBC television in 1968. And at that very same time, the Beatles were recording Birthday. They started re recording it in the studio. They went back to Paul's place on Cavendish Avenue, watched the, the film, then went back and finished Birthday in the studio. Um, that film had Little Richard in it, Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. And uh, the Beatles recorded Birthday that same day, all in one day. So I have a few quotes here from, uh, from Paul and Ringo and people in the Beatle world. Paul McCartney was quoted as saying, from Tutti Frutti to Long Tall Sally to Good Golly Miss Molly to Lucille, Little Richard came screaming into my life when I was a teenager. I owe a lot of what I do to Little Richard and his style, and he knew it. He would say, I taught Paul everything he knows. I had to admit he was right. In the early days of the Beatles, we played with Richard in Hamburg and got to know him. He would let us hang out in his dressing room, and we were witness to his pre-show rituals with his head under a towel over a bowl of steaming hot water. He would suddenly lift his head up to the mirror and say, I can't help it because I'm so beautiful. And he was. Um, a great man with a lovely sense of humor and someone who will be missed by the rock and roll community and many more. I thank him for all he taught me and the kindness he showed by letting me be his friend. Goodbye, Richard and a wop a uh, Ringo said, God bless little Richard, one of my all-time musical heroes. Peace and love to all his family. Billy J. Kramer says, I was very saddened to hear about the death of little Richard, one of the all-time icons of rock and roll. One of my fondest memories was doing a show at the New Brighton Tower Ballroom with the Beatles and little Richard. Rest in peace. Pete Best tweeted, memory, sad to hear of little Richard's passing. I remember George diving under a table to grab a piece of jewelry Richard threw into the crowd in Hamburg. George came up smiling, covered in dirt, holding the brooch. Hmm. That was a quote there from Pete Best. Mark Lewison said on Twitter, John was floored by Paul's uncanny ability to mimic that screaming and hollering little Richard voice. Everyone was amazed by it. Ian James says that Paul would often break into it without warning, as if little Richard was trapped inside and occasionally surfaced for air. Uh, Brian Ray from Paul's band says, there was only one little Richard. We were so lucky to have, to have him sing and play for us all. R.I.P. Richard Penniman. And Rusty Anderson from Paul's band says, little Richard transformed the musical world and will be missed. I was very lucky to have played guitar on a recording with him, a cherished memory. And Joe Walsh today posted a photo of him and little Richard. And Joe wrote, our last photo together, a good friend to the end. Love you, man. And as you would expect, lots of tributes have come pouring in from the hierarchy of rock from people like Bob Dylan and Brian Wilson and Mick Jagger. Anybody want to comment on uh, little Richard? You know, I guess you could say, in a way, and, and, and this gets said about a lot of people uh, who die, at least lately, that if there wasn't a little Richard, there wouldn't really be the Beatles. I mean, there would not necessarily that the Beatles wouldn't have happened as a group, just that what little Richard did is so part of their DNA, the DNA of their sound. You know, Paul's... Paul's vocals, all that stuff, um, the number of things that they did of his, the fact that he was a, a huge star and became friends with them when they were on, you know, just starting really, you know, they just signed with EMI. He was, he really was a crucial figure. You could say the same about, you know, if there, there'd be no Chuck, no Beatles, if there was no Chuck Berry or whatever. I mean, there, there'd probably always be a Beatles, but they'd be different Beatles than we know if not for those people. Yeah, they all made such significant influences 
And it's hard to just pin down one person and say who was the most important of all those 50s rockers, whether it's Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, the Everly Brothers. This, you know, those are among, you know, the most important Carl Perkins, too. So, yeah, very sad news uh, about the passing of Little Richard. I think there would be one other sort of Beatles connection, too, with him is it's significant that the EP that they did, Long Tall Sally, if I'm not mistaken, I believe is the only EP that they released in the UK that none of those songs are on any other albums or singles. Am I correct in that? Is that correct? In the UK at the time, yeah. Yeah. In the US they were, but that's because the right. albums were so screwed over here. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and that also was released, it has been released as, um, I think that was a Record Store Day release mm -hmm. a few years ago. I think when the mono vinyl albums came out and the, the mono box came out, I think that's when they released that. Mm -hmm. So anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, in other news, it was made official in the past week. Paul McCartney's European dates have been postponed due to COVID-19. The Glastonbury Festival for June was canceled a while, a while back, so it's only natural that Paul's shows would soon follow. And yesterday we learned that the International Beatles Convention, which normally happens every year at the end of August, also has been canceled. Last week, we heard big news about a song that Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr wrote together called Angel in Disguise that was done for the sessions for Time Takes Time, but didn't make the final cut. You'd certainly have to question why, considering <laughs> it's a collaboration between Paul and Ringo. Well, the song is being sold on a cassette copy for the upcoming Omega Auctions online sale on May the 19th. Tony Prince, former Radio Luxembourg DJ, currently heard on the United DJs radio station, is selling the cassette, which is expected to fetch up to uh, 20,000 pounds. According to Tony, he was asked to find artists to cover the song in the 1990s after Ringo rejected the song. The cassette actually has two versions of the song, a rough demo with Paul on lead vocals and a fuller mixed version with musicians and backing vocals and Ringo singing lead. Another Ringo song, Everyone Wins, is also included on, on the cassette. And 25% of the proceeds will go to the NHS Charities Together COVID-19 Urgent Appeal. Tony is actually my boss at United DJs, where they carry my Beatles show every little thing. And he said the song was sent to his production company to see if they would do a remix at the time. Tony says he's hoping the publicity around this song will inspire Paul to finally finish the production because the title, Angel in Disguise, is just perfect to recognize the bravery of the nurses who are risking their lives for us. All right. Last Tuesday night on May the 5th, Cheryl Crow appeared on Stephen Colbert's show, remotely, obviously, and from her home performed George Harrison's Beware of Darkness, just her alone on the piano. And I might add, it was really beautiful. Cheryl's latest album called Threads has her cover of Beware of Darkness, which has Eric Clapton, Sting, and Belinda Carlisle on the record. A most appropriate song for what we're living in right now, Beware of Darkness. And this past Saturday, there was a live streaming event, another concert to raise money for COVID-19, uh, in this case, working together with UNICEF. And there was a small tribute paid to George Harrison, featuring a clip of him performing My Sweet Lord at the concert for Bangladesh. And then Sheryl Crow talked about how his event has now raised tens of millions of dollars for UNICEF. And that led into what looked like the same video of Sheryl Crow performing Beware of Darkness that aired on St Stephen Colbert's show. Also on Saturday night, Billy J. Kramer did a live streaming concert from a studio on Long Island and gave a one hour concert featuring his hits from the 60s. Some of his newer songs like To Liverpool With Love, which he wrote partly as a tribute to Brian Epstein and plenty of his favorite songs from the 50s. Uh, more news, you can now pre-order Bruce Spizer's upcoming book, The Beatles Finally Let It Be, 
like Bruce's previous anniversary books for Beatles albums. This one also includes contributions from Bill King, Al Sussman, Frank Daniels, and Pierce Hemmingson. The book is due out September the 4th, but is subject to uh, possibly being delayed due to COVID-19. I've also heard that there is a new Blu-ray and DVD in the UK only for The Family Way, which just came out, but not in the US. It's for Region 3 players. Let's hope that there's a release here in the States at some point for that. And Record Store Day has been moved to three dates, August 29th, September 26th, and October 24th. I know that uh, Darren's been in mourning ever since he heard that news. So, uh, yeah. You, you, you got that straight. I was very <laughs> bummed. I mean, because it's a national holiday. It's a day of, uh, uh, of, of obligation that we all must, uh, you know. But now there's three of them. So, you know, got to look at it like that. Yeah. I haven't and, seen and, and actually, I think they're going ahead with the normal plan of uh, the second record store day being Black Friday. If that's the case, if I understood the press release correctly, that means there's going to be four consecutive record store days in the fall, late August, late September, late October, which is the uh, (coughs) replacement for the record store day that just passed, and then Black Friday uh, would be the, uh, you know, the other one. So Mm. that, uh, looking forward to that. And definitely uh, looking to see if I could get some sort of maybe secondary job, uh, <laughs> you know, or raise some funds, you know, you know, got to think, you know, got to, got to, and plus we have a lot of things to purchase come the end of the year uh, with all these potential box sets and whatnot. So, so are there, are there, are there are different lists of stuff for each of the record store days or, or what, how are they going to do yeah, that? Yeah, they took, I'm pretty sure what they said was happening was the big main list that had been released whatever earlier in the year was being broken into three. So I think that's what they were going to do to stagger the releases over those three days in late August, late September and late October. And then I would assume, and I could be wrong. I'm just assuming this, that there'll be a brand new list for, you know, record store day, black Friday in November. Right. So uh, there was a few different reasons why they opted to do it this way. And I think one of them is to, you know, to try to really help out the independent record stores and create more foot traffic, I guess, later in the year. Hmm. And of course, who knows, come it was going to be, you know, it was initially April 18th and then moved, I think, to the 20th of June. And the way things are looking now, there's really not no guarantee. In fact, I would think it's a long shot, uh, even in June, if we would be able to. You know, go to retail outlets. Right. Well, I think it's a good idea to spread it out over these dates. Yeah. Yeah. And we still have Flaming Pie, which last we heard is coming out in July. So until we hear any further notice of any delay for that, something to look forward to right there. So let's move on now to our main topic which is Let It Be, and a book that came out in the year 2004 from Steve Matteo, who is our special guest. Steve, let's just talk about how the whole book came about. And were you approached to do this book on Let It Be? And prior to this, had there been a lot of books just specifically on this one album and film? Okay. Well, I had heard about this series called 33 and a Third, which was going to be these small books on individual albums. And um, I, con- I found out who the publisher was. I found out who the editor was. I reached out to him. And um, he, he thought it would be great if I did a book. And he actually initially wanted me to do something on Bob Dylan because my first book was on Bob Dylan. And I was sort of like, well, you know, I've kind of already done that. And, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do Dylan again. And so he said, well, we, don't, we also don't have a book on – the series on on the Beatles. He goes, what about the Beatles? And so I was all for that. That was a great idea. And um, and I chose Let It Be. It was my choice, not because it's one of their best albums, obviously, but because I thought it was a great story. And it's sort of the end of the Beatles. Uh, it's the it's the end of the 60s. It's, 
you know, all the sort of it's going on with Apple Records and the Beatles breaking up and and all the bootleg tapes and there was a film. And so to me, there was I think the journalist in me felt that it was a great idea for a story. And um, this was around the time, too, when there was a lot of news about uh, tapes from the sessions at Twickenham and Apple, you know, being found and all the stuff with the Phil Spector murder trial. And so I felt that it was a story that was still continuing. It wasn't just like something that happened in the past. It's frozen in amber and it would it would just be that. So that that's what sort of inspired me to do it. Well, there are no stories in, in Beatle history that are frozen. <laughs> right. You know, they always have a life and we'll always discover new things about it. But um, what was your approach in doing this particular book? Was there a lot on the backstory of everything leading up to Let It Be and whatever dissension there was within the band at the time? Or was it more strictly a book on concentrating on the music? Well, I think that the way that I approached it is there really there have been, you know, obviously books on, you know, Sgt. Pepper and what have you. And there were already a couple of books on Let It Be. One actually was on Let It Be and Abbey Road together, sort of a, a kind of a, a short, long out of print book that was part of a very short lived series. And then, of course, as you all know, there's the monumental Doug Sulpey book on uh, the Let It Be period, which, you know, is very much a sort of day to day and sort of chronicling, you know, every single song, you know, even if it was three seconds of a song. I think that's a lot of what he was really attempting to do. You know, he and he is a he is the Boswell of Let It Be, as far as I'm concerned, that his book was indispensable in in doing this. I think what I did really was you know, I'm a journalist and I, I approached it that way. And because let it be the film was a documentary. I think that my, my writing approach was, it was almost a documentary approach where I just wanted to sort of kind of cover the film, the making of the album, the rooftop concert, the period of what was going on around that time. My jumping off point was sort of the, performance that they did of Hey Jude, which I guess was originally aired on on David Frost. And then, you know, obviously I take it through the whole making the movie, you know, recording at Apple, whatever was done at Abbey Road, and then all the aftermath of that, the bootlegs, and then, you know, everything else that, you know, came after up until recently, you know, or at least up until, you know, I wrote the book. So uh, I didn't attempt, you know, I purposely didn't attempt to make it all about the bootlegs and all about the detail of, you know, the various Glyn John mixes. And, you know, it's a short book, too. It's not a two or three or four or five hundred page book. It's 125, 135 pages. So I, I sort of had a confined sort of length to cover the period. So. I think the book works for people who know nothing about this stuff. They can sit down and read it. But I also think that, you know, Beatle experts can glean something from it, at least at that time. I think there's been so much more written about the period since then. And of course, anything that was done during that period that didn't originally come out on the on the Let It Be album, but came out on Abbey Road, came out on Beatles solo albums. So uh, there, there's been more about this that has come out. You know, I've, I've interviewed people through the years who would have been perfect for the book, but for whatever reason, I couldn't interview them when the book came out. So, you know, I've continued to learn more about, you know, the period. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly Richie Unterberger's book on the unreleased music and movie stuff, you know, he tackles quite a bit of this quite well so you know there's there's always something new about as you said the beatles Mm. the past is not the past (laughs) it's past present you know but you know now of course we're going to get again the movie and the box set you know when i interviewed you know michael Lindsay hogg for the book 
he indicated at that time, and this is, you know, 2003, roughly, that they were planning to put the film out on, at that time, I guess, DVD. I don't even know if Blu-ray was even out at that time. And they were going to have all these extras and everything. But, of course, it never, it never happened. They had it, they had it ready to going back to 1995, before the anthology. They were working on Let It Be and Shea Stadium as DVD releases. Neither have come out to this day. Mm. That's why there's some of it in the Beatles anthology, which is in very good condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Not on Blu-ray, still. Right. <laughs> Steve, I wanted to ask you, and maybe you sort of just kind of um, alluded to the timing, because now it's, it's uh, so many years since your book was first published. My memory seems to put your book right at roughly that time when talk was heating up about the movie coming out we had let it be naked i think had just been released correct me if i'm wrong yeah yeah it had just, uh, and then it your had book just been released along, and it would the stage was set for your book to almost be like a handbook to go with the movie which was going to come out again it would get an opportunity for people to see it for the first time in years uh the opportunity for some people to see it for the first time and it never happened yeah, you know, and it was it seemed to be like uh, uh, your book was primed to be the uh, almost like the the go to handbook to go with the the uh, big reissue that never happened. Right, coincidentally, it wasn't. It, it just it just was it was you know fortuitous and right. or would have been fortuitous. And you know, I try to I, I try to sort of equally cover the album and the movie. You know, right, right, it, right. It, it, it is somewhat linear, I think the way that I wrote it, I think uh, most of it anyway, not the beginning probably, but, you know, so yeah, I was very excited, you know, because Michael, I think was the first person to tell me about this. The information was probably out there and I had forgotten that there were different times that they were planning to do it. But as these things go is you never know what is going to come out. I mean, I, I think there's this, there are sort of competing agendas, you know, there is sort of, the Beatles collectively in terms of what should be reissued. But then there's, you know, Paul very much on his own. And now George's estate, you know, very much on his own, which obviously they are now going to begin to take a very, you know, aggressive and ambitious agenda of reissuing things. And it really looks like they're really now going to take some real control over this just in time for all things must pass, by the way, which I think is great. So, um, you know, I mean, and Yoko has said from early on, from not too long after John passed away, that she would try to bring something out every year, you know, to keep his memory alive, you know. And, um, you know, I, I think, too, that the, the way that they've reissued things over the years is there's been a lot of very poor work on the reissue front until really the last you know, several years. I think the last several years has been the best that we've seen in terms of the quality and, you know, how, you know how things make sense in terms of the way that they do it. Yeah. So, um, uh, what about all the McCartney box sets that have been in the last ten years? You don't rate that highly. No, uh, I think that when I say the last several years, I think that I'm. I think that that's what I'm including. You know, I think the Beatles stuff. I think where they really started to hit the, their stride, I think, was was with Sgt. Pepper. I think the Magical Mystery Tour, the Blu-ray and the vinyl set, I think that's an excellent set. I love that. But I think solo-wise, I think they've been doing a really good job for a longer period of time. You know, I think the, a lot of the McCartney stuff is excellent. I think it's great. I don't have it all because some of it I'm, I'm either I wasn't able to get through the record company or it was at the time it was it was too expensive i couldn't afford it <laughs> you know it's all different too i mean there's some stuff that's it's very much about vinyl records there's some that's very much about cds there's a lot of the mccartney stuff the the way that they do the boxes in terms of the the book part of it is really excellent you know you can't have all of this stuff un unless you're independently wealthy you know <laughs> Well, I borrow everything from Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, had you um, 
I imagine that you listened to all the bootlegs that were available to you at the time. It looks like, um, just from reading through the bootleg section on the book, that A.B. Road hadn't come out yet which would have made it much easier for you because you could just go from start to finish chronologically and hear all the Nagras. But um, did you did you spend a lot of time with the bootlegs that were available at the time? It, it seems so, you know, based on the way the book reads, but just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that I listened to all, you know, I, there's probably like 50 plus hours. You know, yeah. one of the people I interviewed said that the, one of the film people I interviewed specifically said that when one of the Beatles showed up, they were to start rolling film and turn on the tape recorder mm -hmm. until the last Beatle left. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, 50 plus hours. So I listened to a lot of what I considered the, the sort of quality bootlegs, the ones that, you know, really made sense. And I was very lucky that I had a number of folks who either sent me bootlegs or made copies for me. And um, so I tried to focus, you know, on the stuff that I didn't listen to everything, but I listened to the, you know, the ones that were the better ones, the ones that maybe highlighted some of the, you know, the cover stuff that they did, which I find, you know, fascinating. Mm -hmm. The different, you know, sort of the, I guess the two primary Glyn Johns versions. Right. You know, so um, I, I recently took out to go back to listen to one that I think is interesting because it's, it's a, it's a radio broadcast is the BCN one, the, um, right. the incense strobe, whatever the, yeah, yeah. what's the correct title? Incense strobes that, that, and something. <laughs> I can't remember. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that one is probably, I guess the best. I mean, you can listen to that, you know, it stands alone. You know, you can listen to it. It's the quality of it. The fact that there's these commercials from 1971 or whatever the period was, you know. So yeah, I listen to I listen to this stuff a lot, and and you know, uh, I, I, I my memory serves me that a lot of what a lot of Paul's sort of, you know, how he was working on you know Let It Be or the Long and Winding Road. I mean, you know, I listen to the whole rooftop performance, you know, and good quality bootlegs. Um, so at the time, yeah, I think I listened to, I listened to as much of it as I could very thoroughly, but I did not honestly listen to every single minute. I think that, you know, the reason I'm asking is because this is something that you in a way seem to go back and forth on in the book, but you acknowledge something that few people were acknowledging at the time, the time being 2004, which is that it was not all dismal you know, which is what they're trying to show now with the Peter Jackson film, that it wasn't all dismal. But you've, you've in a way, paved the way here, you know, by talking about and also quoting people who had worked on the sessions as saying, you know, I don't remember it being all that, you know, everyone fighting and all that. They were having a lot of fun. And you hear that on the bootlegs, you know. So, you know, everyone now is going to be saying, oh, well, you know, it's revisionism and they're changing history. But, you know, it's it was there. It's on the bootlegs. It's in your book, and uh, and there's that aspect of it. Uh, how do, how do you feel about that? Because you you sort of give both sides of it. You know that there were these tensions between them, but also that they were having fun. You know. Yeah. No, Alan. I'm glad you brought that up because you know when I first heard about the film coming out, I was sort of like you know on the one hand I thought okay good we're gonna get more which is, you know, great. But, you know, I like Michael's film and I like Michael a lot as a person and as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he's probably feeling a little slighted. But then I, I did remember just what you said is that, you know, there was this sense that it wasn't all doom and gloom. And one particular person, I don't remember who it was who said this, that, you know, John would walk in a room and literally everybody would fall down on the floor laughing yeah. because he was such a cut up, you know. Right. So. So, yes, that was the case. And I, I did try to bring that out to some degree. You know, I always thought that the album that there was too much focus on the negative aspect of it, you know, as an album. OK, I mean, here's a, here's a record that has, you know, the long and winding road, let it be, get back and two of us. How can that be a bad album? I mean, that's just insane, you know? And the film 
is, you know, you do get to see these guys up on the big screen or on VHS or Laserdisc. And you do get to see them playing music at the end there together as a band. So, you know, I, I, I never looked at it as negatively as some people did. And, and I know that Paul, you know, hated what Spectre did with the album. And I know that John has made some, you know, some really, really cutting remarks about the whole sort of period in the process. I often wonder what Let It Be would have been like if they recorded it in June instead of January. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it would have been a little different, but um, I hope it isn't just a total whitewash, the film, because that that would be then it wouldn't be a documentary. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my approach as a journalist. You know, I always like this idea of doing something like I'm writing something, but try to try to create it through the prism of another media. And so, like I said before, because Let It Be is a film and it was a documentary, I tried to almost pretend like, you know, I was the Maisel Brothers or I was D.A. Pennebaker, you know, making my own sort of documentary. Right. But obviously I was writing it, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it, th there is a lot of negativity there, too. But there, I think there was a lot of good stuff and good memories and happiness that, you know, gets forgotten. I think that there's a lot of people that like to just say, oh, you know, the 60s was – you know, just people doing drugs and, oh, you know, they didn't stop the war and it was just a lot of baloney and it was just, you know, fashion and, you know, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, I, I, I don't agree with that. People say, oh, the baby boomers, they blew it. And, you know, we have them to blame for everything today. And it's like, oh, please, you have yeah, to really? be kidding. <laughs> Who says that? <laughs> Who says People that and what's say, their address? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, I say, well, what about, you know, you know, women's rights, you know, e you know, equal rights, you know, voting rights and the environment. And you know, there's so much good that came out that started there that we're still we're still grappling with and struggling with. And, you know, there's, you know, so much, you know. It's like, so it's people love to paint things one color. It's it's all black. It's all white. Right. You know, I'm more about the shades of gray. I think as a journalist, that's what you see with anything. It isn't all one thing. It's never like that. You know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm wondering when it comes to these sessions, and like we just said, you hear about the gloom and doom, and it couldn't have been just the, just that. There had to have been times of happiness in the studio. Could it very well be that the Twickenham sessions were more unhappy and Things just picked up as soon as they went to Apple Studios? Yeah, I think that that's a lot of it because, you know, it's January. They're on this big, cold sound stage. You know, there's all these cameras pointing at them and they're sort of standing there going, well, what are we supposed to do? You know, and and all of this tension that has been going on now since, you know, since, you know, even like after Sergeant Pepper, I think, is where all the sort of like Pepper becomes this like peak of them all together and they're all happy and you know, everything. And then it's this slow, like any relationship, whether it's a marriage or any kind of working relationship, you know, I mean, they're in this pressure cooker. There's never been any other pressure cooker like the Beatles, mm -hmm. you know, in this time period too, the sixties, you know, storm of, you know, this cultural renaissance, this change, like nothing we've ever seen, you know? So I think obviously once they, say, okay, well, we're going to make a record and we're going to get, we're going to get out of Twickenham. And they got into their own little cozy, little Apple records basement. Although that was when they first got there, obviously a problem because they didn't really have a recording studio waiting for them. And they had to rely on George Martin to sort of scramble and, and, you know, bring some equipment over from, from Apple. Uh, I'm sorry, from Abbey road. So, um, I, you know, I look, let's face it. These guys are not actors. I mean, you know, regardless of how great a hard day's night is, you know, these guys make music. And I mean, I think that once they started focusing on let's we're making music now, I think that that changed. And, and it was George who was really who said, you know, let's leave Twickenham. Let's make a record. And then it was it was he was instrumental in bringing Billy Preston in. And I think, you know, there were several people who said, or it's been said through the years, that, you know, when Billy got there, it was like a guest coming over. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going to, everybody's going to be nice and put their best 
foot forward. And, you know, so I think that that, I think that that he brought good vibes to, to the, to the affair too, and to some degree, I mean, he didn't change it, but I, I think that, and then after that, I mean, they weren't, they really kind of ended that this let it be period as far as the recording of it pretty quickly or the most part of it. And then they moved on and then they said, look, why are we doing this? We'll put this to the side, you know, let's, let's get with George Martin. Let's make a proper album. Did they know it was going to be the last album? You know, you could speculate and say probably yes, but not definitively, you know, yeah. it's so easy to dwell on the negative, which yeah. a lot of people do. When it comes to Let It Be, they focus on the fact that George walked out on the Beatles and the argument that he had with Paul that the film and a lot of what was said at the time from John, you know, pretty close after it happened. But as you said, Steve, there's a lot of gray there. It never is black and white in anything. But when you spoke to, to Michael Lindsay Hogg, did he tell you a lot more about the sessions that maybe you can tell us about? I mean, he sort of was very helpful in sort of walking me through, you know, how the rooftop concert kind of came about and like a sense of the different personalities and, you know, kind of what was going on. You know, he didn't obviously, you know, he didn't talk about the music that much. I think there was a certain amount of bitterness with with Michael because, you know, the film sort of got delayed and, you know, he had just went through this same thing with the Rolling Stones, with the rock and roll circus, right. you know, where they did all of this stuff and then it didn't come out until what, the 90s, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but he, but he he's just a lovely man and he, he wasn't negative about it, but you can sense there was a little maybe regret would be a better word. I, I don't think that he was ever given his due. You know, I think that if you sort of look at Richard Lester, you know, where he received such accolades for what he did, you know, with A Hard Day's Night. And, you know, what the, he received the, the, what was a Lifetime Video Music Achievement Award from MTV, and, and rightfully so. But, you know, Michael was making these videos, if you want to call them that. You know, Michael was on these uh, British music TV shows. I mean, he is a significant person in presenting not only just the Beatles visually, but presenting rock music visually, you know, he is a pioneer. You know, he did Brideshead Revisited. That's right. I mean, he he made a career on his own as a film director beyond music, beyond the Beatles, beyond the Rolling Stones. He's a painter. You know, he he has an extraordinary story. His life is an, an extraordinary life story. I highly recommend reading his book. Regardless of whether you know who the Beatles are or not, that is a great book, his memoir. It's a truly great story. He is a wonderful writer. And, um, you know, he he keeps things, he's pretty quiet. He's pretty understated. He doesn't, he's not a self-promoter in any way, you know. He made himself very available to me, and I didn't, I didn't take advantage of that, meaning I didn't abuse the privilege, you know. He... He was very open and available, and um, I think whatever I've had to say, whatever he had to say that I felt was significant, I think is very much in the book. I don't think it was necessarily very revelatory what he offered me, but he helped me understand the making of the movie and and that period. I talked to a number of the people that worked on the film, and they were all very helpful. There was one thing that was revelatory, I thought. When he was asked to he, to cut out um, a lot of the John and Yoko stuff, and um, he tells Peter Brown, uh, well, you know, I, I think it's really interesting stuff. And Peter Brown says, well, let me just say that I've had three phone calls this morning. <laughs> I thought that was a revelatory moment, really. Yes, that yeah. that was the, the, the probably the chestnut of <laughs> of, of of it all. Yeah. And th- there's no question about it. Yes, that, that was part of one of the things. And I think I talk about this. And I, and I always hate to talk about this because it's always, you know, here we are. We're going to talk negatively about Yoko. You can't avoid it, I guess. But, yeah, her presence, 
was, you know, did bother the other guys, <laughs> he said in an understated way. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, look, the way that they always did things was, you know, nobody else in the studio. Now, yeah, sure, people would show up. You know, Linda would show up or there would be people that would show up. But the sort of unwritten rule always was, you know, it's, you know, it's us four and George and whoever is the engineer, you know, and that's kind of the way they did things. Yeah, there were other other musicians that occasionally occasionally show up. But, um, you know, I think it was more of a question of John was just the distraction. And, um, you know, he was he was in his own little world with her and, you know, for, for good or bad. So, and I think that this was a time when John was, you know, and Yoko were at different points struggling, you know, with, with drugs, with custody of her children. Uh, She was pregnant. Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on here. John's starting to, you know, obviously branch out more as a solo artist for, you know, whatever that is. So, you know, um, they tried to be a democracy, I think. Yeah. I mean, they really did. And at different times, it wasn't. You know, there was times when John was the leader. You know, there's times when Paul was the leader. You know, there's, you know, and as far as people walking out, I mean, during the White Album, you know, you know, Ringo walked out during the White Album, you know. So that was nothing new. That, that was nothing new. You know, there were, there was always, you know, you have to remember, I mean, even the sort of pre-recording history, you know, Stuart was in the group, you know, Pete Best was in the group. Go back to the Quarrymen. I mean, this is, the, you know, they, they went through a lot of changes in a very short period of time. You know what I mean? I mean, the Who are still together. The Rolling Stones are still together. The Moody Blues. I mean, we can go through the list here, you know. <laughs> yeah. So for them, in a very short period of time, there's this massive change, you know. I have, I have a theory about why Let It Be is looked at as such a supposedly bad time when the tapes, in a lot of cases, say otherwise. And I think it has to do really with hindsight, and even hindsight from 1970 to 1969. Um, because, first of all, like as, as you, mentioned, you mentioned in your book, when John met Alan Klein for the first time, that's like um, a couple of days before the sessions end. It really wasn't, you know, they were not absolutely at each other's throats until Klein became an issue, and it was three of them against Paul. And that got really very seriously, uh, you know, there was a lot of infighting about that. And, and it, it was not pleasant on either side. But none of that was happening during the Let It Be sessions themselves. And I think that, you know, the fact that it was delayed so long, um, I don't know if you remember, but in Rolling Stone at the time, there was like a running joke um, in the letters column. You know, every several issues, someone would write in and say, when is Get Back coming out, the Get Back album coming out? Uh, in fact, I have a friend who wrote one of those and it got published. But it was sort of a running thing because we kept hearing reports about this album. Those bootlegs, you know, that BCN bootleg, the bootleg itself wasn't out until the CD era, but that was a recording of a show where the acetate, got to a radio station and it got to, I think, um, what was then in WABC FM in New York or WNEW, I can't remember which, but I remember them playing it. I taped it, listened to those tracks for a long time before the quote real album came out and um, consequently found the real album kind of disappointing because of the specterization. But I think a lot of people are sort of looking back at, you know, John's interviews from late 69 and 1970, uh, talking about what a horrible time they had at Twickenham and, you know, the fact that the one argument is in the film. And it really comes down to one argument in the film. There aren't that many more arguments on the bootlegs. You know, there were funny discussions like, you know, John saying, uh, yeah, if you know, we, we if we can do the middle eight when the sun can comes up, God can be our gimmick, you know. And then George saying, "Well, you're daft, you know. We're going to get people and put them on a boat, and then we'll be stuck with them, and you know, getting out to the desert is crazy, <laughs> you know." <laughs> so I think, well, I mean, yeah, 
yeah, go, go, I, no, I just think ahead, it's Alan. a lot of go retrospect, uh, you know, thinking of, of, of how those sessions were. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, you know, people argue with each other. You know, married couples who love each other argue with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are in a band argue with each other. If you, I mean, that's just, it's, you know, wow, the Beatles argue with each other. There's no news there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, let's face it. But I think that, by the way, I think that the original bootlegs of the BCN, I think, did come out on vinyl first. I think they were pre-CD era. Hmm. I'm almost positive. The one that we were mentioning before, mm -hmm. the strobe lights, whatever, <laughs> that's silly. That came out originally on vinyl. I'm almost positive. So they, awesome. those came out pretty early. I think these bootlegs, you know, because I think the whole sort of bootleg industry really starts with, you know, Dylan and the band, mm -hmm. and then then it's Let It Be. I think those are the two sort of big bangs of the whole bootleg thing, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I think the revisionism thing, I think that's a, a lot of the theme of where you're, where you're going there. You know what it is, too, is I think that there's days that these guys wake up, Paul or Ringo or in the past, you know, John, George, where they wake up and that day they have these wonderful glowing memories of being in the Beatles. And then there's days that they wake up and they wish they had never been in the Beatles and everything in between. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So if you're interviewing John Lennon on the day that he's nostalgic for being in the Beatles, you're going to get the warm glow. The days when he's so glad he's married to Yoko and is not in the Beatles anymore, you're going to get that. You know, there's a story, and this is a true story, that John and Yoko went to the movies with Jan Wenner of Rolling Stone to see Let It Be. Right. And they were all crying in tears because they missed that. You know, that we were, yeah, well, that was the 60s. And yeah, I was in the Beatles. And so, and I don't think that that's a made up story. I believe that that's, that is a very true story. So on that day, John, even Yoko was nostalgia, has nostalgia for that time, you know? So, you know, look, it's all of this stuff becomes, you know, what is it? There's three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth, <laughs> you know? So yeah. it, it, be, it becomes, you know, look, there's days I have no interest in putting Let It Be on, you know? There's days I'm in the car and one of those songs comes on and it's like, it just, I turn it up as loud as I can and it just, it sounds so good, you know? I mean, I think everybody has different Beatle albums or different solo albums that they don't want to hear anymore and some that they love and they they constantly want to hear. You know, you raised a really good point there, Steve, about John in particular, that he was one person that you can never pin down to one thing that he said on a particular day. And that's how he felt the rest of his life. It could never be that way with John. And I think in this particular time in his life, he was going through his own personal hell. One thing we, we didn't bring up is that the British press apparently was very cruel to Yoko. Mm -hmm. And John had to deal with that. Plus the miscarriage that Yoko had in, in 68. You know, the, they went through some really rough times. And then how much does heroin come into play? You don't really know. I like to ask people all the time whether it's overblown, the whole aspect of heroin and how much did that play in the breakup of the Beatles or John's relationship with the other Beatles, but there's so much going on and that's just John's side of things. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's true. Totally. And, you know, people, you know, they, they sort of forget that they sort of forget that Yoko Ono was Yoko Ono before she married John Lennon. You know, she was an artist in her own right. You know, she was, she was a figure in the underground art world. And she moved in these circles. It isn't just like she's this unknown, you know, Japanese artist. And I love that because there was a certain, let's face it, there was a certain amount of, I'll say it right out, I mean, almost like racism against her, you know. So I think that she's she was a misunderstood figure. I think now I think people realize, yeah, you know what, Yoko was, she was her own person. She was an artist. She was an important figure. She wasn't a mass media figure, you know, she wasn't popular like the Beatles. Everybody knew who the Beatles were. Everybody knew who John Lennon was. 
But, you know, Yoko was this, she, whether you like her work or not, whether you like her or not, you know, she was her own person. She was an important figure on the artistic underground, so to speak, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Aaron? Steve, one thing about Let It Be that I always found fascinating was that it never really seemed to be a concrete plan in place uh, throughout the project. At the very beginning, there was a, you know, we were going to do it. There was talk of a movie, a talk of a TV show. Let's film the rehearsals leading up to this big grand event. What event? They could never agree on what event. It all boiled down to them going up on the roof, which seemed to be like a last minute, oh, what the heck decision. And then everything stopped and nothing was ever done with with the tapes, with what was filmed. And that was always a fascinating thing for me, uh, that there really was never any concrete plan of attack to what they were doing in January of 69. Can you, in a, you know, maybe in a nutshell, kind of walk through that month on the line of thought, what they were thinking at the beginning of the sessions, what they wanted to accomplish, uh, and how they went off, off, uh, off track during the course of the month, ultimately from talking grand plans like performing in Egypt at the pyramids and they end up on the roof and then right. none of this ever comes out for a year and a half. Right. right. Well, the one person that sort of gave me a lot of insight about this was Dennis O'Dell, who was the, who was a producer, a film producer who worked on a number of the films and he, he wrote a great book and he was there when they did the, what became the, performance on David Frost, where they did the Hey Jude out, uh, Hey Jude song, and where they basically had the backing tracks on and they sang live to it. Okay. And um, they really enjoyed it because it was as close to having performed live that they had done since, you know, Candlestick in at the end of August 66. So they said, well, maybe we should play live. That's really the starting point, the jumping off point. So then they're like, okay, so how do we want to do this? <laughs> and of course, you know, they call them the four-headed monster. They all had opinions or some had stronger opinions than others. And so they were like, okay, well, we should obviously we should film it. Makes sense. Okay. If we're going to do this thing, we're definitely going to film it. Okay. So if we're going to play live, then we need to rehearse. Remember we used to do that? <laughs> okay. And so, all right, so we're going to film the rehearsals. Now, why they decide to film the rehearsals in a place that isn't a rehearsal space, maybe that was the first mistake that they made. Okay. I, that's speculation on my part. So they are making this movie, but it, what it is, is not really a movie. It's the rehearsals to do a live concert. And yes, like you said, Darren, there was so many ideas that they had that, you know, we'll go to the pyramids, we'll go to the top of Mount Everest, we'll, we'll go to the roundhouse around the corner and just play a concert. So I don't think they ever really knew what they were going to do until they started thinking about, let's just go up on the roof. And then we don't have to worry about, you know, selling tickets or inviting people or security or any of this I mean, could you imagine if they actually had a concert, okay? Let's say they did it at, you know, any number of venues, you know, the Royal Albert Hall, you know, Madison Square Garden. Could you imagine the nightmare that people would kill for that ticket, you know? Tickets would be selling for millions of dollars, probably. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds insane. So the way that they ended up doing it was probably made the most sense. So I don't think they ever, like you said, they never really had a plan. It was always this constant changing. They were going to go on the QE2. They, they had all these ideas, you know, that, and they were all, look, this is the 60s and you're the Beatles. So you can basically do whatever you want. You know, you can, if you right. want to, if you want to go to the pyramids, you can go to the pyramids. I mean, yes, they never really knew exactly what they were going to do and it was constantly changing and it was whoever had the right idea that day. I think that Ringo didn't really want to travel at all. Ringo was not a fan of traveling, okay? Because he, he's, he has a weak stomach, I think, and he doesn't want to have to deal with weird food. I know that sounds like what? Yeah. <laughs> but, well, that was I his whole that, thing with India. Right, yeah. exactly. 
But plus, and he had a deadline. George, he he had to leave to right. to do Magic Christian, so he couldn't mess around. Right. You know, right with Peter Sellers. Right, yeah. you're right. That's that is an important point. That's I'm glad you brought that up because that was significant. So, I think George just the whole idea of it was sort of like, why are we doing any of this? It's like I don't. I think he was waiting for the. I think he was waiting for the group to sort of end, and I I think John was too in some respects, you know. I think Paul just, he really wanted to, he loved being a Beatle and he really wanted to keep it going until like one of you brought up before about Alan Klein and the management where he was the one that didn't want to work with Alan Klein. I mean, look, let's face it. Some of that is, you know, he'd rather work with his, you know, father-in-law, you know, I mean, that that makes sense, (laughs) but is that really fair to the other three just to, kind of switching around. You know, we'll, we can blame Mick Jagger for Alan Klein entering the picture because I, Klein always had his eyes on the Beatles, okay? But Klein was working with Jagger, and I believe it was John that contacted Mick and said, well, you know, what do you think? And Mick was kind of like, yeah, it's fine, but the Stones were already having their problems with him at this point. I don't know, maybe, you know, it's been, it's been suggested. I don't know if I agree with this or if there's any truth to it that, you know, Mick wanted to kind of, you know, fob off Klein onto the Beatles. So he would get out of their hair. (laughs) I mean, who knows if you want a villain at this point, I mean, is he a villain? You know, if you want to choose one, I think that he wanted the Beatles and he would do anything he could to get them. John really seemed to hit it off with Klein, which is so bizarre, you know? I mean, to this day, Klein, you know, his estate owns all of the Rolling Stones recordings up before whatever the last album they did before. Let uh, it bleed. Sticky Finger. Let it bleed. No, no, no. Let it, so Let It Bleed, yeah. I guess the live album came out after Let It Bleed. Is it, that the chronology? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think he owns that one, too. Get Your Yayas? Yeah. 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 So he owns all of that, you know, all what was considered the London years of the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. I mean, Abco, you know, his children, they still own all of that music. So, you know, there's so much going on here. There's so many players. There's so much the world drastically changing Look, the Beatles were going to end regardless of Yoko Ono and regardless of Alan Klein. I believe that. You know, if Brian Epstein doesn't pass away, if he has his life together and remains their manager, you know, people love to speculate about this stuff. I didn't really spend time speculating about this stuff when I when I did the book. I, I don't think I get I get into that much at all. The groups break up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean. That's why I have the, the music business we have today, where you have 19-year-old girls, you know, dressed up like little tarts. And, you know, you don't have bands anymore because the record companies don't want to deal with bands. They don't want to deal with the birds. They don't want to deal, you know, with these bands where every person in the group has something to say, has talent, has an artistic vision, wants to, you know write the songs, wants to be on the A side, if you were the days of 45s, because that's where all the money is, you know, they don't want any part of this. They want it. They want something that they can control, that they can manufacture. And they don't want to deal with, they don't, I mean, what's the biggest band in the world these days? I mean, that of, that has talent and integrity. What, you know, Radiohead, nobody's telling Radiohead what to do, you know, I mean, that's just the nature of the this, the music business that we have these days. It's all sort of manufactured. That Why it was so great back then was because you had groups. You had multiple talented people. The Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Kinks, Pink Floyd, Yardbirds. I mean, we could, you know, the Burrs, the Beach Boys, the Buffalo Springfield. I mean, that could go on and on and on, you know. I have a question that I'd like to pose to the three of you. And I think I know the answer, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway on our last show in which we talked about the first mccartney album for its 50th anniversary i mentioned this date of march 23rd 1970 because it had been said in wikipedia that paul mccartney was in abbey road studios finishing up the mccartney album and that very same day phil Spector was there in another studio 
to work on Let It Be. So I went and checked it out, and it is true. It's in Mark Lewison's book, The Complete Beatles Chronicle. The two of them were there the same day. Now, I don't know if they were there at the same time, but I do know I, I find it significant that March 23rd is the first day that Phil Spector worked on the Let It Be tapes. So it's not like he could have played anything for Paul in which he made any changes to it. But would any of you happen to know, obviously John and George worked with Phil Spector before this with Instant Karma. Did Paul ever have any contact whatsoever with Phil Spector throughout this whole process? And did Phil, was he just given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted to do? Or was he given any feedback from, well, from John, George, or Ringo? He was supposed to be doing it on their approval. Like, they were supposed to have acetate sent to them when he did anything significant. And Paul didn't get an acetate of Long and Winding Road, which is really the one thing he objected to, um, until early April. Which I guess is about, if, he, if, they, if Phil really started on the 23rd of March, he must have gotten it to Paul about as soon as he could. April 14th, Paul writes a letter to Klein, basically saying that he wants that track completely remixed. He wants the harp off it. He wants the female vocals off it. And he wants the Beatles instrumental parts raised in the mix. And they claim that it was too late to do. But April 14th for an album coming out May 8th, I don't think so. But did Paul ever have any contact whatsoever with Phil Spector? Not during the Let It Be sessions that I know of. Um, they met in 64. They, they knew each other. But I don't think so during the, the time that he was working on Let It Be. Because Paul was working on his own album and not that happy to go into the Apple offices if he could avoid it. You know, he was, he was sort of, he was distancing himself already. So I I, mm -hmm. I haven't read any any accounts of him running into Phil Spector during the time that Spector was working on Let It Be. I don't know. Maybe Steve has. Steve? No, I mean, this is something that I don't remember exploring deeply because I don't think, like Ken said, there was no meeting. There was no, they didn't meet. For all we know, Phil didn't know Paul was there and Paul didn't know Phil was there. Or Paul was there in the morning and Phil was there. You know, we don't, we don't know. I mean, no, no one really knows. I would imagine that if either one of them knew the other was there, I don't think either one of them would want to make a connection with each other. Because first of all, Spectre was a nut, okay? He was crazy. <laughs> and for, you know, Paul, as normal as Paul could be, he's a more kind of normal person, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm understating this here a little bit. And I'm sure Spectre felt like, I don't care what these guys think. And, you know, if you look through the whole history of the Beatles, you know, when it came time for people to mix the album, they weren't around. Like, they were done. They did their part. Okay, now you guys do your part. Now, of course, later on, they did become a lot more involved. You know, I guess particularly on, like, the White Album and Abbey Road and, you know, they were a lot more involved in that process. But I still think that there was a sense, as crazy as this sounds, that they write the songs, they rehearse them, you know, they record them, they get them to a point where they feel that they're pretty much done. And then they say, OK, George Martin, now you do the mix. OK. And for many years, it was all well, they were mostly concerned with the mono mix, even though obviously George did a stereo mix. And then, of course, Capital took it and did God knows what that was. It wasn't a true stereo mix. We all know how horrible those albums are, okay, the Capital albums. So while it may seem fairly unusual, I think in some respects it was a little bit of a continuation of business as usual. But you're isolating, Ken, one day that we don't know the particulars Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, I, and I, I appreciate you wanting to get to the bottom of this. And ever since you brought it up to me, I want to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> but I think other than getting McCartney to answer the question specifically, 
I don't know. I, I tell you what, I'll, I'll ask a question. When Paul was at Abbey Road, who was he there with? I mean, was he there with George Martin or was, I mean, what was he, was he just, wh- who else was with him? Um, John Kurlander was know there. That? John Kurlander was there. Um, it, it, basically just the engineers um, because he was producing okay. his own I first album. I interviewed John Kurlander for the, okay, I interviewed, I interviewed John Kurlander for the book mm-hmm. and I don't remember that coming up. But it might have come up. I don't remember. But I think John is a person who was around. I'm pretty sure that if I have this correct, John has had an illustrious career working on film soundtracks, Mm -hmm. including some of the Lord of the Rings movies. So he's a guy that is still around. He is. So I would try to now, you know, I interviewed him. This is 16 years ago. I would try to track him down, you know, and I'm not just trying to play devil's advocate here, but I'm always a believer in if I don't have the definitive answer to supply, I'm not going to really speculate. But if there are people that might have that specific answer, and obviously, from what I remember of John, he was somebody who was pretty sharp and seemed to have a very good memory of things and was very helpful. I don't remember my specific, if I specifically quoted him or what I specifically quoted about him in the book, but I do remember that, you know, he was pretty helpful from what I remember. Yeah, you did quote him. He was actually, uh, at, at the time Paul was working, he was the assistant engineer, and I can't remember who was the main engineer. It, oh, uh, that wasn't Phil McDonald either. I but, don't think I interviewed Phil. Yeah, he was, you know, but uh, it's very likely that they didn't run into each other because Spectre would have been in one studio doing his thing. Paul would have been in another. If Paul in those days was not, you know, eating lunch at the EMI canteen, he would go out you know, to a restaurant or something. And uh, in fact, well, he lived around the block, you know. So right. it's very possible they could have been in the same building and not seen each other at all, you know. I mean, it's fascinating. Ken Michaels has created a, <laughs> you know, a, a fascinating scenario here that it, it's going to catch like wildfire, I think. At <laughs> yeah. This point. I, I, I'm not I, kidding. I not. No, because I know, you know, I'm joking, but I want to know now too. I mean, I'm being silly. But I think those are the kind of questions, you know, a good journalist is going to ask. You know, somebody who's a historian, those are the kind of things that you want to know. And so, you know, it's impossible to know. This is what I mean about this. This is why I chose this album and film to write about, because I knew there was so much out there. And, yeah. and I would never thought I would get to the bottom of everything. And, you know, all of this stuff is unfinished history. And this is why I love when a new book comes out or there's a new interview or something in it or a new movie or, you know, it's, it's, I'm endlessly fascinated with wanting to learn more about all of this stuff and you can never know it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no question about it. And that's the beauty of it. I, it's, I never get tired of this stuff. Mm-hmm. If anything, I think I'm more interested now than ever. <laughs> I always say you will never know everything about the Beatles. No matter how hard you try. <laughs> Even Mark Lewison, I think. And, yeah. and that's why we all, we love Mark so much, because of the detail. I mean, I read this 1,600-page version of Tune In, okay? I had to read it. And it was like, it's monumental. If he doesn't get knighted, there's truly something <laughs> wrong with the world, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, and I, I, I interviewed him when they put that version out in America, finally, the 1,600-page version. And I interviewed him by email, and his answers were just unbelievable. He is God, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, call it the, I call the recording sessions book the Bible. Yeah. That's how I refer to it. I don't call it the recording I sessions book. I agree with book. you. I agree. It is just, I have his other books, too. And he is just, I'm enamored by his thoroughness. As a journalist... You cannot not admire him. You know, I don't pretend to be in his league. I mean, I can't wait to read volume two. I, you know, I wonder, like, can, will he do it? <laughs> you know, there's been these great biographies beyond music. You know, there's a there's a five part biography of Ernest Hemingway, which is a definitive biography. And the guy died like right after the last volume 
was put out. John Richardson was working on the definitive biography of Picasso. And John knew Picasso. And it was, I think it was going to be five or four, three, I forget. But I think there are two or three that were out and he was working on the next one, which wouldn't have been the last one. And it'll never be, it'll never be completed. You know, I'm a big fan of biography in general, not just music. Mm-hmm. Well, he better get it done. We're all going to be uh, protecting him. <laughs> I'll do <laughs> anything sure he wants. happens to him. <laughs> Whatever he needs. He needs food, money, blankets, you know, any whatever he needs I, because it just it will be so great and i hope he does it the way that they did the first one where they put out this extra expanded version which it took it it took quite a while for it to be officially published in the united states it was only published originally in england right you know yeah. so uh i read the first one you know tune in when it first came out and then i read that version when it was published in america his publisher thanks to him, sent me a copy of it. And then I interviewed him about it specifically. And reading it was just, you know, it's heaven reading it. I don't know if you've all read that version, but yeah. um, it's just, you know, I take it out every once in a while and I just like look at it. <laughs> you know, I just turn the pages a little bit. You know, it's just, it's one treasures that book. I treasure that almost as much as I treasure some of the albums, you know. Yeah, well, the Beatles' history can be just as compelling as the music. Oh yeah, I agree. Uh, kind of launching off my uh, my uh, last question, Steve, about the uncertainty about exactly what the whole month of January was going to be. Once they were finished, very neatly at the end of the month of January. Okay, f- for those who are don't know the the the, the story. What was next? I mean, why did the, the two attempts at putting together an album, the Get Back album, fail? Uh, and what was the process of the decision that let's start putting together a movie now? And why did it take so long for that to happen? OK, if I remember the chronology correctly, is I think that the first Glyn Johns mix was an attempt to actually put the album out more sort of in real time. OK, and then it it failed. OK, and then they went off and did Abbey Road. OK, and if I'm wrong here, guys, you can you can correct me. And then I think the movie, the impetus to finally get the movie out was Klein wanted to get the movie out because he smelled money. And then therefore, we also want to get the soundtrack album out, which I think that gave Glenn Johns another shot at it. And it didn't work. I'm not entirely sure if it's if it neatly falls into place that succinctly, but it's it's more or less like that sort of. And then it was I believe it was, you know, George was the one that actually said to John to work with Phil Spector on Instant Karma because he John was really having trouble getting Instant Karma together. So, you know, George was very much a champion of Phil Spector and obviously you know, he went on to do All Things Must Pass. And then, you know, of course, John did, you know, recorded extensively also with Phil Spector, too. So they never had bitter feelings of Let It Be, obviously. I mean, that's obvious to state. So I think once they did Abbey Road and put Abbey Road out, they were done. Like, they were like, whatever, we're finished with this. We don't want to go back and relive Let it be. I think artists very much, especially when they're in the period of the most sort of fruitful periods that they're like Bob Dylan said, you know, don't look back. They don't want they want to. What's the next song? What's the next album? The next show, the next project, the next collaborator. I think they don't want to go back. You know, I mean, Dylan is famous for this. I mean, he goes in the studio and he just wants to bang it out. And he's done and and he doesn't want to look back. Having said that, we have this now incredible bootleg series from Bob Dylan, Mm -hmm. you know, which is proof, which is proving that, you know, and then, of course, he wrote his the chapter one, as I call it, (laughs) of Chronicles, which is, you know, he obviously Bob Dylan doesn't have a clock or a calendar. (laughs) If you read Chronicles part one. You know, right. and, and I know why he did that, because he doesn't want to lay it down straight. 
because he wants to remain mysterious, but this is not a Bob Dylan podcast. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think to let me remind you of some stuff that is in the book. So you had, had, had dealt with it, but Klein also, um, in one of his probably better managerial moves, recognized that the Beatles still owed United Artists a film and that he could persuade them that Let It Be was the film that would close out that contract. Um, right. So that was, you know, you you put your finger on it when you said he smelled money. It was it was partly that, but also that actually did help the Beatles get out of a a, a contract that was still unfulfilled. And uh, was it true that they found out after the fact that Yellow Submarine did not fill the? Uh, well, they found the, out at the uh, time they did. They had offered it to United Artists, and they said, "No, we um, we want a live live Beatles film." So they wouldn't take Yellow Submarine as fulfillment, and so it went to MGM. Right, right. right. So then, uh, let's right. go back. Initially, the deal. The go ahead, Darren. In other words, the idea now is let's go back and revisit all that material we filmed back in January '69 and do something with it, and we could end up making them happy and uh, and get this material out. Basically, right. Yeah. And they didn't have to do anything either. It's they're not movie makers. They're not going to mix the album. Right. I mean, the initial the, the initial deal that the Beatles had with UA was to do five films for this really horrible low, you know, percentage. And then this is insane to even think it, but UA turned around to Brian Epstein and said, "No, no, it's okay. You only have to give us three, and we're going to give you a better percentage." Which that would never happen today. <laughs> but they were smart to do that. They wanted to you know, look as Brian and the Beatles. You want to be on good terms with these people. So yes, uh, a hard day's night and help fulfill the, the the two of the three. So you know, Magical Mystery Tour was their little TV show that the Beatles wanted to make, and then Yellow Submarine, like you said, United Artists, which is the, they probably still kick themselves. They're not interested. I mean, I think that what the deal is with a lot of these films is the Beatles don't own the rights to any of these films. Like A Hard Day's Night is not completely it's, – it's not – I think it's shared with these people who bought the rights to the film with the Beatles or something like that. I think there's a book all about this. Speaking of Mark Lewison, Mark Lewison was involved with that book. So, And I think Walter Shenson actually owns – totally outright owns the rights he i did. believe to help uh. and is and yellow submarine or i forget this but it's a very convoluted s- sort of history but yeah it was smart what klein look klein renegotiated their contract too with emi which brian had already done in i guess 67 i believe it was mm-hmm. so you know that was a lot of the reason why they hired him was because that was what Klein was known for, to get the artists the money that they deserved. They were all being underpaid. They were all being screwed. It was the 60s. You know, these were kids when they were kids when they signed their contracts. They just wanted to have record deals. The, the whole idea of you're signed by EMI, you're signed by DECA is like a miracle. It's just, it's, it's insane. Like they, they never thought it would ever really happen. They were kids, they were dreamers. You know, but they were also practical, too, and knew that there was a good chance that this might never really happen for us, you know. So um, and this is why I wrote this book, (laughs) because this period, this period here is just it's rich with material. You know, you know, when I think back on it and people have asked me, have you ever thought of writing a more extensive version of the book? I mean, I've thought about it. I don't think the publisher would ever really want to go back and redo it because then it becomes something that's not part of the series and that's not what they're looking to do. I mean, I'm surprised there haven't been more books about the period. I mean, I think there was the there's been a couple of books recently that kind of cover the period, but they're looking at they're looking at it more as Abbey Road and Let It Be Together. I think Ken Womack's book. I think that Tony Barrow is his name, not to be confused with Tony Barrow. I mean, I think his book is almost all about, for the most part, the rooftop concert. But he touches on, obviously, material and, you know, 
time frames that are around that period. And there was two books. There are two books. books by people who were actually on the rooftop: um, Ken Harrington and uh, Kevin Harrington, and um, Ken Ken Mansfield. Mansfield, right? Yeah, right. Ken Mansfield's book. Ken's written several books. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ken's book, but and but Ken's book is kind of covers a little bit more of the of the period. Also, mm -hmm. it's not as specific. I mean, what my book is. I mean, look, when when they signed me up, they thought I was going to just write about the album. But that would have made no sense. Right. And they were fine with it the way I did it. They were they did very little editing on my book. They just trimmed it. It was a, it was longer than the contract called for. And they didn't even trim as much as to bring it down to what the contract originally called for. I mean, I didn't have to do any work on that book after I wrote it. They literally just cut like, you know, a, a, a thousand or I forget I forget whatever the whatever the, the word count was. They just trimmed it. Is all they really did. I was going to ask Steve, what are your uh, hopes for uh, what is going to be coming out later this year in the way of the 50th anniversary of the album, the uh, the original film coming out again, plus the brand new film. Do you have any hopes and uh, wishes uh, on, on what those will turn out to be and what they might include? Yes, definitely. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing the film because I, I admire Peter Jackson. I'm not a Lord of the Rings guy, but I've watched all the films. They're, they're, he's a wonderful filmmaker, and I think they picked the right guy to do it. I mean, they wanted to do Lord of the Rings. You know, they wanted to do that as a movie, The Beatles. Right, right. Never happened, obviously. We all know the story. Yeah. Okay. So there's obviously an affection there for that material. And so Peter is a natural fit. And he recently did a documentary, I believe, on World War II or World War I. One. And, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember which it is. So I'm looking forward to the film. I'm also looking forward to them putting out a package with the original film, too. So it would mm -hmm. be nice to have it on Blu-ray and watch it at home whenever you want. And all the extras and the interviews and all of that great stuff. As far as the, the music... I thought the Let It Be Naked was a missed opportunity. I mean, it's interesting to listen to it. It really flows as an album with all the other stuff taken out. I think it misses the charm of the original album. I think they should have released an entire disc of the Rooftop concert. I think there should be an entire disc of like the oldies or the covers, you know, the more complete versions. And maybe even right. one disc of you know, Teddy Boy and, you know, All Things Must Pass and, you know, that stuff. I mean, I think that would be the right way to do it. I hope they put That's it out on Those vinyl great and CD. Yeah, I hope they yeah. put it out on vinyl and CD like they've done with, you know, with Pepper and with the White Album and with Abbey Road. I think that's the right way to do it. Two separate packages, you know, because I think there's a lot of people who are maybe young people who are not interested in the vinyl, Okay. And I think that there are some people who maybe that if they're really into it, they're going to want to have both. And so you buy one, you know, you, or you, what I do is if I, if, I can't, if I can't get both from the record company, then I, they send me one of them. And then I ask for the other for my, my birthday, Christmas, and, <laughs> or Father's Day. And that's what those days are for, to get Beatle material that I don't have. <laughs> that, you know, and get it as, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not being funny. It's, it's the truth, you know. <laughs> So, Steve, what do you have coming up next? Dinner. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, what do you I, have coming I'm up working, next that we can read? <laughs> I'm working on some different things. And, you know, let's just say that I think that there is another Beatles project on the horizon. Uh -huh. But I'm not at a point where I can really talk about it. So I'm always writing. There's always I'm always doing the journalism. And I'm, I'm writing a lot these days about reissues. You know, that's mostly what I'm writing about. I mean, through the years I've written about reissues, but I've always written about that with writing about new music that gets released. And it's really reached a point where I'm really more focused on, you know, the last few years, just really writing a lot about reissues. You know, it's very difficult dealing with the record companies to get them to send music I'm not going to review music from a stream. I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. It's just me. I'm not trying to sound pompous or anything, but, you know, to get a CD out of a record company, 
to get a vinyl album out of a record company is you think you were asking them to give blood. Yeah, you know? it's, I, I tell I me about total, it. <laughs> totally understand. And, you know, it's I, I deal with people who re, who who deal with publicity for the Beatles reissues. I think they try to do the best they can, and you know, and others too. That's I work on, and, and it's just enjoyable. I'm really into writing about vinyl. I've, you know, I've, I've always been into vinyl, but in the last, you know, four or five years, I've really gotten back into it in a big way, you know? So I'm really into the way records are made. You know, I don't do as much in the way of interviews like I used to do. I don't really review live shows as much as I have. One thing I can talk about, and Darren, you in particular are going to really love this, I just finished writing a story about the Pink Floyd, the later years box set. And I nice. interviewed I interviewed some of the people that worked on it. And so I literally just finished that and sent it off. Oh. And all so right. when that is done, that monster is done. <laughs> you'll all know about it. All but, right. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that covers it. Can you say where that will appear? It's an online music publication called Something Else Reviews. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, I've done a number of pieces for them already on the Rolling Stones, on Blue Note Records, on Robbie Robertson, the band. I forget what else. But so, yeah, that was a long gestating piece. I literally worked on that for like four or five months. Wow. Wow. Uh. Now, your book on Let It Be is still available. Yes, it is definitely completely, totally in print. And I still get royalty checks every six months, <laughs> which is nice, most, mostly every six months. And um, it's available through Amazon. I don't see it in the bookstores as much, you know, but it is out there. It is easily available. People do buy it, you know. Um, so uh, as John said, it's... Uh, it's the usual rubbish, but it doesn't cost much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also available as an audio. Yes, it's. I believe Audible. I think it's still available by through Audible, but I think Spotify is the place now where they've done this new Spotify version of it. And I did, and and the I did a podcast through my publisher, and that podcast is available through Spotify. You can you can. Hear it on Spotify, mm -hmm. on the cool. Let It Be, on all about the all about Let It Be. Cool. All right. Well, this has been great. Before we end the show, let's all give the folks listening our contact information. We'll start with you, Darren. All right. If you want to uh, reach out to me, uh, email me at wfuv. It's Darren Devivo, D A R R E N D E V I V O at wfuv.org. I have two Facebook pages. I'm trying to figure out to, uh, how I'm going to revamp the two of them. Uh, one is just Darren DeVivo. The other, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Join both of them. Send me a friend request on one. Like the other page as I rack my brain and trying to, again, revamp two, two pages. And basically, those are the best ways to get in contact with me. All right. Very good. Alan? Okay, so the easiest way to get in contact with me is also on Facebook. Um, I also have two pages, uh, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. So Remixed has more Beatles stuff. The regular Alan Cozen one is more classical and political comments, whatever I feel like doing. But they're almost interchangeable. You can reach all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's our email address. I'll do it again because it's so long. Things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter page at things we said fab. We also have a things we said today. Beatles Radio Fans Facebook page and a regular old Things We Said Today Facebook page. The super official one is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans, and we post the episodes there when they're ready. Also on Podbeam, um, YouTube, and iTunes. Right. We're all over the place. 
Yep. Okay, Steve, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? All right, let me see if I, I won't take as long as, because I don't have all this great social media. I mean, I'm on Instagram and I'm learning more and more about it. I don't post much. Um, Twitter, it's Matteo, M-A-T-T-E-O, media. So at Matteo Media. And again, I think somebody says something like, I, I, I normally have been posting a lot of political content on there to educate people with facts. <laughs> but <laughs> but ever since ever since this virus, I have just felt I felt compelled to just give it a rest. But I've been getting back to it a little bit. But I also will post some music things there, like if I'm on a podcast like this or something like that or an article. Uh, I'm on Facebook, which that's another place where I will often publish not my political rants, but putting the facts out there. I'm sorry to use the F word, um, <laughs> but it's Steve Matteo. I'm on Facebook. It's pretty easy to find. I'm, I'm easy to, you know, if you Google me, I'm out there. I can give you my email. It's, a, it's kind of a long, weird email, but I can give it to you if you want me to. Sure. Okay. It's H-I-F-I-S-J-M, Stephen Joseph Matteo, at ix.netcom. Dot com. And I know you want me to repeat that again, right? It's H-I-F-I-S-J-M at I-X dot netcom dot com. You make our email address seem simple <laughs> compared to yours. I've had, that, I've had that email forever. And I was told when I first did it that the weirder you make your email, the more secure it is, supposedly. Who knows? Okay. Tomorrow never knows. Uh, Meanwhile, nobody knows how to get in touch with you. I'm I'm Googleable because people find me. I mean, people get in touch with me because, especially like I said, since the Peter Jackson film announcement, I've had people find me who want to interview me and want to talk about it. And um, you can definitely you can you can find me. People seem to have no problem finding me, which is almost a bad thing sometimes. (laughs) And one other thing. Go to Steve's Facebook page or one of my Facebook pages. We're usually ranting on and on about the Jets, the New York right. Jets. Right, exactly. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that didn't come up because this has been a fun, upbeat conversation. I've enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'm the last man standing here. So my contact information is: you can reach me at every little thing at att.net. Uh, I also have a Facebook page at Ken Michaels. And I just want to say something about my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. As many of you know, I have Beatles trivia that I post every single week where you can win one out of nine prizes, either books or CDs or DVDs. I just did an interview with Chip Mattinger and Mark Easter. They are the authors of Eight Arms to Hold You, which is the ultimate solo Beatles reference book for all four Beatles going through the year 2000. They've just updated that book as a PDF, and you can win that as one of the nine prizes on my website. The interview that I just did with Chip and Mark will soon be on my website on interviews page four. I just did another interview with some guy, Steve Matteo, I think his name is. Not Nobody's Steve laughing. So I'll just... I've, I've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that after two hours of hearing us talk with Steve, It's certainly not enough for most of you. If you want to hear more talk with Steve, you can find that on the same page, interviews page four at KenMichaelsRadio.com. There'll be a brand new Talk More Talk podcast coming next Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern. That's on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. All right. This has been fun. Thank you, Steve, so much for joining us. Thank you. And hello to all the Beatles peoples out there. <laughs> and, and it's been fun. I learned so much um, hanging out with you guys, whether it's, you know, at a concert with Darren or uh, doing a podcast like this. Uh, Steve and I were at the Doobie Brothers uh, a performance at the Beacon Theater. It was supposed to be two shows, but it was when they performed the Toulouse Street and the Captain and Me albums in their entirety now available as a live album dvd and i do believe there is a ever so quick split second shot 
where I think I see us in the audience. Okay. You and, I, really, and I got a really nice guitar pick that night. They were throwing, at the end of the show, we moved up real close, and they were throwing guitar picks. And I have this beautiful guitar pick from Patrick Simmons, this, like, what is it called? Pearl? What are, I'm not a musician. What do they call that? But I was lucky. I saw it go in the air, and I tracked it down, and I, and I got a beautiful souvenir from that night. Yep. All right. Darren doesn't invite me to any of his concerts. I just want you to know that. What? <laughs> I invited myself to that concert. I, I actually contacted Darren and said, can you buy these tickets and we'll That's go together right. and I'll, I'll definitely yeah. pay you. Yeah. And he did. <laughs> yeah, I, it, was, it was supposed to be two shows. And right. I well, I think it was. Canceled, what happened? <laughs> no, I, what happened was they were going to do one album one night and one the other. Right. And I think you bought tickets for both nights and I was only going to go the night that they did the captain and me oh, no. and what they decided think- to do instead was they performed both albums both nights and that was the right. whole and tour that was it that they didn't do I any other both. shows and i was supposed to go to both shows and i think i ended up missing the first one uh right. but was there uh with you for the second night which turned into the uh the broadcast and the album yeah i you don't think that they were taken from both nights i think they were taken from both nights i believe I don't remember now. Yeah, that I think they were. were. I think the were video, people. I watched the video, and I think there were from both nights. But this is not a Doobie Brothers podcast or a no, Bob Dylan not. podcast. <laughs> I was just going to say, we have a Doobie Brothers podcast in the making here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. And for Darren DeVivo, Alan Cozen, and Steve Matteo, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. And we will see you next time.